What's up guys? Right, first Grand Prix of the season done. One down, 20 more to go. We waited so long, didn't we, for the Australian Grand Prix and finally it's done and dusted. We've had it. What did you think? Well, I mean, there was so much to talk about already just after that first weekend, which means there are loads and loads of questions. So many questions for this week's Ask Elvis. Thank you so much for all of those. I guess we better just crack on and get into it. Um, first of all though, I am going to take the dogs for a walk and, uh, and answer some of those first questions whilst we're out and about. Should we go for a walk? Should we go for a walk? <laughs> Roll the sting! Roll the sting! Right, let's get things going with this one. And this question that I've picked here is pretty typical of lots of questions that I had this week. Understandably, all about Ferrari. I've picked this one from Carl Slocum, but there were loads. Carl says, why is it that the Ferraris were so far off the pace this weekend? Have they found themselves in a development cul-de-sac this early in the season? And does that mean the Mercs are going to run away with it? Uh, well, Carl, first of all, I think it's it's way too early to say anything like that. I know that there was an article um, on the BBC Sport website, which I'm sure many of you have read from somebody they're calling the uh, the secret aerodynamicist, which, by the way, I think is a great idea. Nice little coup that they've managed to get somebody from within the world of Formula One to talk um, openly without sort of under the under the kind of uh, protection of anonymity so that's quite nice we get a nice little insight through that from some uh, somebody with aerodynamic background they talked in that article about uh, potentially Ferrari's front wing design with that inward loaded uh, front downforce front wing um, potentially maybe having less scope for development as the season goes on it's all very much speculation very talking about potentially they might have these issues potentially they might have those it doesn't mean they have suddenly run out of development at race one. Um, now, if we're going to look at the Ferrari issues, I honestly and genuinely believe this, and I know that loads of you have said, you know, this was all about Mercedes sandbagging uh, over the course of winter testing, and this is what they always had, this, this potential. Um, and, you know, Ferrari were giving everything they had, whereas all of a sudden Mercedes have just turned it up or whatever and gone quicker. I don't buy that. I genuinely don't think that sandbagging happens. Uh, in Formula One. Um, the only time it could ever happen, in my opinion, is if somebody has an embarrassingly quick car that they don't want to draw attention to um, for fear of getting you know, too much attention from the FIA or things getting banned, that kind of thing. In most situations, you never sandbag because you need to unlock your potential. You need to understand how your car performs, what it can do. So from, your, from a team's perspective, you just can't afford to start holding things back like, like that. So I don't believe that's the case. In terms of Ferrari, to answer Carl's question, I just think what's happened here is that they had a car on day one in Barcelona that was straight out the box, super quick, super reliable. It did everything they wanted. Uh, it was in that sweet spot right from day one. And what happens when you get that situation or what can happen is you don't really have to start chasing the car. You don't have to start, uh, you know, changing too much to find the right balance because it had the right balance straight out of the box. And that means, you know, that's great for testing. It means you can go flying through your program. The car feels amazing. You're banging in lap times. But when you get to a different set of circumstances, and let's not forget, Australia is a totally different circuit to Barcelona. It's bumpy. Barcelona's really smooth. Uh, completely different set of corners. Loads of right-handers, uh, loads of, sorry, 90-degree corners in, in Australia. Just a completely different type of track. Um, and what's happened, in my opinion, is that Ferrari have turned up. They, the car is definitely not in the sweet spot. And because they have no experience of trying to work their way out of a difficult situation with this car yet, that's kind of the situation they found themselves in. And as a result, they maybe took a couple of wrong turns and they never found the sweet spot with, these car, with that car. You, you can't underestimate what difference to performance uh, the car setup uh, you know, can have in getting things right and getting things wrong. It can be tiny tweaks here and there. Things like tyre pressures, things like ride heights, aero levels. They all can make a, a significant difference to the way the car performs, not just over a lap, but how it deals with its tyres in race conditions. And it, it can be massive. 
and, and a, a very small tweak here or there or a change of direction in which way you start to to develop or or to uh, follow your setup path can really massively change that at Mercedes I honestly believe weren't comfortable in Barcelona with their car and they had to work through a series of problems to to find the sweet spot to unlock the potential of that car you know they had a week less to do that of course because the car that they actually had for the second week of Barcelona testing was almost a completely different one to that of the first so they perhaps had a week less of development with that car um, and so you know by the time we got to Australia Mercedes were really having to work hard to get that car's performance unlocked and it looks like they did that so maybe they made some correct changes and they followed a correct path in Australia whereas Ferrari just didn't. I don't think it's a case of writing the season off I definitely don't think that it was a you know a representative let's say of how the season's going to go and that we should all be rolling our eyes saying well this is you know no point in watching now Mercedes have have smashed it I just think that was a specific type of circuit where Ferrari definitely got it wrong I've read it made me chuckle a little bit I've read loads of reports and I've read loads of I read a series of tweets yesterday from somebody claiming that it was all because Ferrari had had um, you know that something banned by the FIA their power unit been banned after Barcelona or they've been had some elements told they couldn't use them because of legality and so therefore had to back off massively I just don't buy that at all. Ferrari were as confused as anybody else about where their pace went. You could tell that from the radio exchanges. They just got it wrong. They just found themselves in a situation they were really surprised at. And I think they took some wrong turns. And um, by the time we move forward, that could all change. Bahrain, completely different type of circuit. Completely different circuit. It could well, very easily, come back towards Ferrari in Bahrain. So... I genuinely don't think this is a Mercedes championship for every, you know, and everyone else might as well go away and give up. That's not the case. <laughs> uh, this next question is also one that I saw loads and loads of tweets about. Uh, and it's about Lewis Hamilton and the way that Mercedes claimed after the race they'd found damage to his floor, which contributed to, to his performance. So the question comes, this one from Joe Zayden, who says, do you really think Hamilton had damage to his floor? Uh, or do you think it was just an excuse for underperforming in the race? Um, absolutely not. It was because it wasn't an excuse. Why on earth would Mercedes make up a story about Lewis damaging his floor? I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, in fact, I mean, just to, just to really put this to bed, there are photos, and I will try and dig some out if I can. There are photos of the damage to Lewis's floor. Uh, and on the face of it, it looks minor, but it's not minor because these cars are so sensitive aerodynamically. There's a little section of the floor, the piece that goes right behind, uh, sorry, right in front of the left rear tyre. And it helps to, you know, I've talked about in the videos about the, the Mercedes car and other cars about this thing sort of tyre squirt, where as the rotating tyre squirts airflow out underneath the floor, if it's not sealed off, aerodynamically sealed off, um, that tyre squirt, squirting underneath the floor, really interacts with the diffuser in a negative way and loses a huge chunk of downforce. And that is basically what's just happened to Lewis Hamilton. That chunk of floor got knocked off. Now that could have happened in any number of ways. It could have happened with running over a piece of debris. It could have been that it flexed so much it just caught on the tyre at some point. Or the tyre picked up a lump of rubber or a stone which then just knocked it off at speed. There's any number of reasons. It's a tiny little piece of carbon fibre, but it has a very significant effect. So, yes, that is absolutely what contributed to his lack of pace, but ultimately Lewis Hamilton's race was lost at the start, wasn't it? Um, that poor start, or poorer start in comparison, cost him position, and therefore, because he then lost position, he was then compromised on strategy. The team had to use him to uh, react to Sebastian Vettel's aggressive undercut attempt uh, later on and, and as a result of that Lewis you know finished the race on tyres that were much much older than his teammate Valtteri Bottas and was never in a position to challenge for uh, the race win together with that damage which was picked up on lap, um, about lap four I think they say the data shows meaning that for much of the race he had a massive lack of downforce which also then starts to destroy your tyres much quicker and the whole thing spirals into this knock-on effect where the car just doesn't work as well as it should. Um, so I think with, without all the conspiracy theories it's as simple as that. That's what happened 
Lewis, you know, hasn't disappeared, hasn't gone off the boil. Uh, I think he just got a bad start. And ultimately, um, that is what really then compromises his whole race. And the damage to the floor is genuine. It genuinely is. It's almost symptomatic now of a problem of these modern Formula One cars being so sensitive. So that if you get a tiny little nick, a tiny piece of damage, and we're talking about a piece of carbon fibre that's probably 10 centimetres by 5 centimetres, it's small, but it has a massive aerodynamic effect. So maybe that's a problem that we should be thinking about further on down the line. Reducing the reliance and the sensitivity aerodynamically of these Formula One cars so that they can continue in the race with a tiny bit of damage or something having been knocked off because of close racing. Where's the other one? Here he comes. <laughs> a Kishore Cafle says, with the long chain of cars in the midfield, does it look like uh, cars can now follow more closely? Um, well, do you know what? I think it probably does to a certain extent. Australia is definitely not the circuit to really showcase uh, an improvement in overtaking, is it? It's a difficult place to overtake at the best of times, but we had people attempting it. We had people getting close enough to try and attempt it around the outside of turn three, for example, which I don't seem to remember happening on quite as many occasions last year. So let's hold judgment a little bit longer, but when we go to places like Bahrain, that's the perfect place to showcase these new regulations and see what effects they've had. So, so yes, positive start, I hope so, but I don't think we can truly say until we get to a slightly more normal circuit. Uh, a Delta 3245 says, do you know where Ted's notebook is? <laughs> right, two questions that can be asked uh, simultaneously, I guess. Doug Avery says, when does the ban on tyre warmers come into effect? Uh, that's 2021. Um, so, and that also ties in with this question from 49 Seconds, who says... Uh, what's the impact of the larger diameter rims being? The cars seem to uh, be bouncing more over the bumps. Uh, well, the larger diameter rims don't come in until 2021 either. So for that new big regulation change where we're going to have new cars, new rules, um, and that, by the way, proposal from Liberty and FOM is being put to the teams uh, very soon. And that will be the first chance we really get to see uh, something concrete in terms of what... Uh, they're proposing for 2021 but as part of 2021 we will see larger diameter rims lower profile tires uh, and no tire warmers so the larger diameter rims will have an impact on suspension in fact it's actually the the lower profile tires that will have the bigger impact because at the moment much of that compliance uh, through the car's interaction with the lumps and bumps and the curves and things like that is taken up through the huge balloon-like squashy tyres. So when we don't have that anymore, we will have to design into the suspension systems much of that compliance that we don't have right now. So we're definitely going to change the way that designers have to look at putting those cars together, but it doesn't happen until 2021. Uh, right, back from the walk. Uh, I forgot to say at the beginning of this video, I will be giving away the bespoke Lewis Hamilton painting. Those of you who entered, thank you very much. Loads of you did, really impressed with the take up on that. Uh, at the end of this video, I'll be drawing out a winner, so stay tuned for that. Uh, right, back to the questions. And this one from Rob Hitchens, I thought was a good one. And again, a big talking point from the weekend. He says, uh, hi Mark, it was a good step forward from last year's Oz GP. What did you make of Ferrari holding Charles behind Seb and should they have at least brought him in for fresh tyres to go for the fastest lap if he wasn't allowed to race? A couple of points in that and I'll, I'll expand on them both. First of all, Ferrari, I don't think they had anything really to gain by allowing Charles to overtake Seb in terms of their overall team position. I don't think Charles would have been able to attack anybody in front. Uh, so, so therefore they were going to get the same two positions. What I did like about that was that Ferrari had said before the weekend they were going to prioritise Seb in the early part of the season, and that's what they did. They were decisive in that situation, and that's something we haven't seen from Ferrari for years. And all right, Charles made it perhaps a bit easier by coming on the radio and kind of asking very politely, you know, can I overtake him? Do you want me to stay here? When they, when they told him what he wanted to do, he kind of just did it. You know, you wonder whether Kimi would have been quite so easy and actually in that situation we've seen it a number of times Ferrari have just messed that up because they haven't been decisive enough to come on and go right stay where you are hold position drop back a bit this is the way we want to finish as a team uh, so from that sense 
I know we all want to see cars racing, but you're never going to get teams allowing their two drivers to fight when there's nothing more for the team at stake. It's just a risk, there's no point. So I kind of, I, I appreciate the fact that Ferrari stuck to their guns, were decisive and did exactly what they said they were going to do. Perhaps a sign of the way this new management's going to work. And also on the subject of risk taking, should they have allowed him to come in for a pit stop to go for the fastest lap? Given that he had a big chunk of time behind him, that's what lots of people said. And I, and you know, when I looked at this fastest lap thing, and I will hold my hands up here and say, look, it, it added an element of excitement to the end of the race. I don't think it added anything in terms of excitement in, on track. I mean, we didn't see any more action as a result. We didn't see anything happen. But what it does do is change the narrative of the story towards the end of the race. And you're then relying on the commentators and, and, and that kind of thing to build up that narrative and the team, you know, FOM to, to release the right bits of team radio, which is exactly what they did. So we were able to follow the story of who was going for fastest lap, who wanted to go for it, you know, what the teams were saying in response to that. But the ultimate, you know, fact still remains that the teams will never allow their drivers, or, or certainly in most situations, to make a pit stop and go for the all-out fastest lap. Because making a pit stop, and this is what exactly applied to Charles Leclerc, you know, and the same for Valtteri Bottas, although they had a gap, a comfortable gap to do a pit stop and get back out in theory in the same position, a pit stop introduces a massive element of risk. You know, things can go wrong. And I know that nine times out of ten they don't, but they can. And teams are risk averse in that situation. Why take a risk that might jeopardise the points haul that you have got for that one solitary point? So that's what I think happened to Ferrari. So I kind of understand Ferrari's decision on all of that. But to, to sort of switch on to the fastest lap um, point, new rule, uh, I will hold my hands up and say, OK, it added something, maybe I was hasty. Because I, I wrote this off and said it's a terrible idea. I still actually think it's a terrible idea. I don't think this is what we should be offering points for. The fastest lap doesn't do anything. You don't win a race by getting the fastest lap of the race. You know, So for me, if you want to start offering incentive points for other things, it should be for qualifying, for example. Um, you know, but that's a whole other story. Uh, so I don't really like it. But if we're going to use the TV coverage to build up the narrative of that part of the race, then yeah, it can add an element, a new layer of excitement. And that's what we got. Uh, because the teams will never allow their, their drivers to go and stick a, a sticky set of tyres on and go all out for the fastest lap because of the risk element. Uh, you know, Mercedes even banned their drivers from doing it. They didn't listen, and then Valtteri Bottas absolutely went for it. But they will have to do that on the tyres that they're on. They're not going to get too much assistance from the team. And there's a situation in Formula E last year, Eduardo Mortara, who was leading the race. I think it was in Hong Kong from memory. And they also have a point for fastest lap. He went for it with a few laps to go before the end of the, of the race. Just decided he was going to go for fastest lap. Made a mistake, spun off down the escape road and ended up you know, finishing way down the order. And that is the risk that the teams are terrified of. Risking the sort of guaranteed points haul that you've got in your hand in exchange for one extra one. Yes, it's great if you can get it, but I don't want to put their drivers or their cars at risk to be able to get it. So it's going to be interesting to see how that moves forward over the course of the season, how it changes. Do people get more comfortable with their pit stop routines? Um, you know, to be able to take that risk. Are the drivers just going to go for it anyway? I suspect they are. Um, so I guess in that sense, it's going to be an interesting one to follow. Stuart Pocklington says, at the end of a race when cars get weighed, how do the race stewards take into account cars that have damage and bits missing? It's a good point. Actually, I've got two questions along the same lines this week uh, about that. And, and what happens is the stewards will weigh the cars at the end of a race like they do as standard. If a car is deemed to be underweight, so illegally underweight, they'll obviously go to the team and the team can then come back in that instance and say, yeah, look, it's underweight, but it's because of this. We've got a barge board missing, for example. Here's a brand new barge board from our spares. This is what it weighs. So you can see that if we put that back on the car, it would be fine. And that's the way it works. So you don't necessarily have to do anything unless a car is deemed to be underweight. And then it should be relatively easy to prove what it would have weighed in its most complete form. Uh, David Bigwood asks another question that's been coming from lots of people. He says, hey Mark, what's your best guess as to what the fundamental issue that George Russell says Williams have found that will take months to fix? Uh, Williams are in a world of pain right now, aren't they? The fundamental issue, I mean, we don't know is the truth and I can't really take a guess other than to say it's highly likely to be a fundamental aero 
issue. And, and I guess it rings bells of McLaren last year. If you saw the McLaren video about the MCL 34, their new car, I talked about the fundamental issue, aerodynamic issue, that they had inbuilt into last year's car that took a long time because it was chassis related uh, and not a quick one to fix. So in McLaren's case, they ended up not fixing it and having to suffer the whole year because they didn't really find it until halfway through the year. And then it was just such a massive amount of work, it wasn't deemed worthwhile taking development away from the following year's car to plow into something that was already really struggling and not gonna really rescue their season. So Williams could well find themselves in the same situation here. I don't know what it is, but if it's fundamental and it's gonna take months to fix, it's highly likely that it's something around the chassis design, more likely than not aerodynamics. If it's any of the bolt-on bits, you know, you can fix those, you can change them, you can rush bits through the wind tunnel and the design process to bring them to the car, but it, it doesn't sound like it is. So I would say it's a fundamental aero-based chassis problem would be my best guess. Alan Alak says, uh, what information is given to the drivers to study between qualifying runs, either on those screens or on paper printouts? You see this, don't you, when the drivers pull back into the garage after Q1 and after Q2, they get, often get handed a bit of paper and they're sitting in the, gar in the car studying bits of paper. Well, what that typically will have is, is the data, the trace, the data trace uh, from your last run compared to either your quickest run. So that will highlight where there's tiny elements of the circuit where you're losing time or where you're gaining time. And it's a very visual representation that the drivers can see as to what we may, maybe they were doing in a differently in one corner on a certain lap that maybe improved the entry, for, for example, that then improved the, the sort of exit speed and on down the straight, those kind of things. Or sometimes if your teammate is quicker and you're struggling, you'll have an overlay to your fastest run to your teammate's fastest run. And therefore you get a, a chance to look at what he's doing and, and see if there are areas of what he's you know, the lines he's taking, the breaking points he's doing, those kind of things, whether you can introduce some of that or if it rings any bells in your mind as to whether there's a, an obvious change you could make to your driving style or, of course, part of the setup for, for your car to, to start, make some improvements. So that's what they're looking at is an overlay of two different laps in terms of the data trace. Uh, they're looking at an overlay either of, of their fastest lap against their second fastest lap, for example, or against their teammate's lap if it might be, uh, might be faster than theirs. Uh, right, let's finish on this one. Uh, Dan Metcalf, 007. Dan, thank you. I noticed that you sent me hundreds of questions this week, so thanks, mate. I've picked this one. I appreciate them all, though. He says, uh, after all the scaremongering, do you feel the aero changes were really as negative of one, as 1.5 seconds per lap? Have teams really ploughed so much money into out-developing the deficit over the winter? Um, well, the truth is, Dan, that when that... So people talked about the new aero changes for this year maybe take knocking off 1.5 seconds or, or two seconds a lap, adding on, sorry, to a lap time. So making the cars one and a half to two seconds slower because of the 2019 aero changes. But that prediction was made at that point, so way before 2019 cars existed. And what that was based on was them saying, this is how a 2018 car looks like and the lap time it can generate. If we take away all this outwash, which is what the, the, the teams were, or the regs were designed to do, that huge chunk of performance that you're taking away might cost you one and a half to two seconds. The reality is though, yes, you take that obvious regulation away and then all the focus goes into how we recover that, how we overcome it. And actually the teams have found a number of ways by looking deeper into areas that they may never have looked at in the first place to, to kind of overcome that deficit. And that's exactly what's happened. It's not just about plowing a huge amount of money in. Of course, money definitely plays a role in this, but it's about looking in areas that maybe you would have never looked had that regulation not changed because everything was focused on the old way of doing things. So it's just, a, uh, it's just the brilliance of Formula One engineering in that you give them a problem and they will find a solution to it. They will work tirelessly and yes, they'll throw money into it, but they will find a solution and that's what's happened. And it's for me, it's mind-blowingly impressive that we've ended up coming up with a regulation designed to make the cars go slower and yet we've actually got faster cars than last year with the same power units. It's, it's incredible. I love it. I love Formula One for that very reason. <laughs> right, that is it for the questions for today. Again, thank you so much. There were so many more that I couldn't get through. I'm trying to answer as many as I can 
in the comments section of YouTube and in other places as well. So really appreciate them, they're mega. Keep them coming. I'll keep trying to answer them as long as you want to start firing them in, so thank you. I hope you all loved the Aussie GP. I did, I really enjoyed it. I know that some people have said it's boring. It's not the greatest track in the world, you know, for, for, for an opening round of a season. If you think about last year, these 2019 regulation changes came directly off the back of a, a dull Aussie Grand Prix with no overtaking. You know, this year, yes, we may not have had a huge amount of overtaking, but we had action. We had closer cars, particularly in the midfield. And do you know what? None of that really matters to me because it was the first race. The anticipation, the build-up, the excitement is what the first Grand Prix of the season was all about. Australia's a great place to do it. And yeah, the track doesn't lend itself to, to modern Formula 1 cars. I know that. But look, we can't just have 21 racetracks a season that are massive, wide, Tilka circuits. We can't do that. It's nice to have the mix because it also potentially throws the performance balance around. You know, Ferrari struggled this week. Maybe next uh, next time out in Bahrain, the performance will swing. And if that's if it's as close as that, if it's circuit specific, maybe Red Bull will come into the mix at certain places down the line as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that's exactly what we want. Um, so look, I loved it, I thought it was brilliant, I hope you did too. Uh, I will pick the winner for the competition for the Lewis Hamilton print very shortly, but I've got a couple of little special guests that have asked very nicely if they can do it with me. So hold fire, I will be back. Uh, right, here we go then guys, I've got two helpers. Rex and Ginger, come here! Uh, right, you want to help with this? Yeah! Right. I've put together then a list of everybody who used the hashtag on Twitter to enter, which was hashtag GPBAUS. Uh, GPBAUS. Uh, loads of you, hundreds of you have entered the competition, and so using that hashtag they've all been collected together. So this, guys, is a list of everybody who's entered. All you need to do is scroll like this. Use two fingers on the mouse, scroll. If you get to the bottom you can go back up. Who's going to scroll? Who's going to say stop? Go! Scroll! Alright, okay, that's easy then. <laughs> right, Ginger, that's so scroll, you two fingers, scrolling up and down. Whenever you're ready, you just say stop, and whichever one's in the middle is the winner. Stop! That one? Zyz. So, so that is, yeah, Z-Y-Z-Z. -Z. Aziz El Reyes. Uh, congratulations, you have just won yourself at uh, this. I've boxed it up or put it back in the tube, but you've seen it because you entered, I'm sure. Uh, it's an amazing picture. You are the only person in the world to have one. I will contact you directly on Twitter to get your address. This is on its way to you, mate. Well done. Well done, ZYZZ. <laughs> Whatever you way. Aziz El Eloy. Elise. Aziz El Reyes, maybe. Aziz El Reyes. Aziz El Reyes. Anyway, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations! <laughs>